So my name is Benson, and I'm a geek. Not a, not a geek in the traditional sense, so I certainly wouldn't call me an uber geek, more of, a, more of a closet one, but a geek nonetheless. And here's why. I love technology. It fascinates me. It's a big, big part of my life. It's, it's driven my career, and frankly, it's fun. And that's why I'm here today. Geekdom and technology is poised for a huge leap forward. And its name? The Internet of Things. So what is this Internet of Things, and why should you care? Well, here, the Internet has been around for a while, but it's been mostly the product of people. So all the data and, and images and recordings and games, books and commerce and all of that was created by people, for people, and about people. See, the Internet is one of the most important and transformative technologies ever invented. I happen to know a few people who couldn't live without it. All kidding aside, the Internet is like a digital fabric that's woven into the lives of all of us in one way or another. The Internet of people changed the world. Well, there's a new Internet emerging, and it's poised to change the world again. You see, this new Internet is not just about connecting people, it's about connecting things. And so it's named the Internet of Things. Okay, so connecting things to the Internet, big deal, right? Well, it kind of is, and here's why. Because things can start to share their experiences with other things. Whoa, wait, what? <laughs> How's that work, right? Well, it works like this. You take things, and then you add the ability to sense and communicate and touch and control. And there, you get an opportunity for things to interact and collaborate with other things. So think of it like this. Um, we as human beings, we interact and contribute and collaborate with other people in our own environment through our five senses. We have seeing and, and smelling and, and, and touch and taste and hearing, right? Well, imagine things with the ability to sense and to touch and then add the ability to communicate. And that's where the Internet of People and the Internet of Things intersect. So what are some examples of these things? Well, let's start here. How about your smartphone? You wouldn't believe it how many senses your smartphone has. It knows where you are. It knows if you're moving. It knows how you're holding it. It knows how much light's in the room. It knows how close it is to your face. It knows what you're saying to it. And it even has an eye so it can see its surroundings. Oh, and it also has the ability to communicate in a wireless network. OK, so that's probably an obvious example. How about this one? My bracelet. I'm wearing it up here right now. It tracks my steps. It tracks my activity. It even knows how well I've slept. And it can communicate on a network. OK, all of us probably have one of these in our homes, uh, maybe a version of one of these. It's a thermostat. But this thermostat does way more than just know the temperature in the room. It knows whether I'm in the room or not. And it learns and tracks my home and away patterns to ensure my comfort and save energy. And it communicates on a network so I can control it from afar. So these light bulbs, with these light bulbs, I can create all kinds of moods with brightness and, and, and light and, and dimming and so on. But because they communicate on a network, they know how to listen so I can tell them or other things can tell them to turn on, off, or blink. This garage door opener opens the largest door in my home. And because it communicates on a network, every time it does, it lets me know. Did it open or close? Or I can open or close it from anywhere. Now this thing is the scale that I can step on and it automatically records my weight and puts it in a fitness app. But this thing is not, it's broken. It's, the data is never right, so. <laughs> This thing is something that fits on my dog's collar. It's called a whistle, and it tracks my dog's activities the same way that I do. Now, there's a lot of things that were manufactured and built before the Internet of Things. And the good news is we have tools and systems that allow you to add sensing and communications capabilities to existing things. Uh, the device on the left is called an Arduino board, and it's uh, pretty common in hobbyist circles and prototype applications. The device on the right is called a programmable automation controller. And this device also gives things the ability to sense and communicate. In fact, I use this device in my own home. So 
what are some real world examples of these things in the real world? Well, allow me to take you on a pictorial of my typical day or my typical morning in the Internet of Things. There I am, lying blissfully asleep. And uh, you can see I have my armband on. And the beauty of that is it's sensing my sleep cycles. And it knows the most opportune moment to gracefully wake me up by gently vibrating and blinking a light. Well, that, when that happens, my bracelet sends a message to other things in my home. And pretty soon, a chain of events starts to occur where my things are talking to other things. For example, my thermostat goes up to 80 as my whole house fans start up and draw all the cool morning air into my home, which pre-cools my home, allows me to not turn on my air conditioning for you know, later in the afternoon. Saves me a boatload of electricity. Then my coffee maker starts up, and my bedside lamp fades to bright. So then I'm kind of curious, how did I sleep last night? So I roll over and grab my phone, and the good news is I uh, exceeded my goal. Then I like to get up in the morning and take my dog for a walk. So I put his whistle uh, thing on his collar, I hook him up to the leash, and off we go. A healthy dog is a happy dog, and the fresh air does us both a lot of good. So while I'm walking, I get an email and it says that my spa just turned on. You see, in my day job, we build Internet of Things products for industrial applications. So sometimes my home is used as a demonstration. <laughs> so I go over into my app for my spa, and I ensure that the uh, spa was turned back off. And then, while I'm here, I thought, you know, I wonder how much water went on my lawn this morning. You see, my sprinkler thing communicates with the local water district's thing that senses a bunch of parameters and tells my sprinkler system how much water to apply to my lawn. Well, that's really important today with our current drought conditions, so it's certainly conserving water, and I save, uh, I save on my water bill as well. And then, while I'm here, why not check out my uh, wine aging in a barrel? Uh, at my friend's cellar 45 miles away, all within my app. So I get back from my walk, I, I eat my breakfast, and I scan my breakfast eggs right into my food diary. Everything is good there, kind of wrapping things up. It's time to uh, hug my kids, and I have hug sensors in my shirt that measures how many hugs I... <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, I'm un... That's not true. Uh, I don't have hug sensors in my shirt, but the Internet of Things does include smart textiles and clothing, so be looking out for that. And as I pull away to work, I get a message on my phone that my garage door successfully closed behind me. So, I could go on and on <laughs> about my day's events and how it correlates and interacts with the Internet of Things, but I think you get my point. And, uh, of course, I did warn you, I was a little bit geeky. So, so who cares? That's probably what you're asking yourself right now. Who cares about all this? Well, let's start here. Big business cares, and they care to the tune of billions of dollars. They're making huge investments. You could say they're betting the farm on the Internet of Things. So even General Electric just came out with a two-minute commercial they're running on network television called The Boy That Beeps. You've got to check it out. It's very cool. And IBM has been in this space for a long time, although under the banner of Smarter Planet. But there's a couple of recent developments that I think are worth noting. First is Samsung. They make the handsets, among other things, and they just purchased a company called SmartThings for $200 million. This company didn't even exist two and a half years ago. And in other news, Google purchased a company called Nest in one of the largest acquisitions in the Internet of Things space for $3.2 billion. <laughs> this is a company that makes thermostats and smoke detectors. So obviously these companies think there's something big on the horizon and they're willing to put a lot of money on the line. Of course this week we also heard uh, from Apple, they just announced two new phones and they also announced a watch. And they also have a couple software development kits, so uh, both a health kit and home kit. So I expect a, a slew of apps and, and uh, products that will target home and wellness. How big is the Internet of Things? Well it's been said that the, that the Internet of Things was born at the point in time where there were more things on the Internet than people, and that occurred around 2008. Today, there's over 10 billion devices, things on the Internet, or about 1.5 for every person on the planet. That's expected to balloon to 50 billion by 2020. And that's going to, of course, usher in dramatic billions of dollars of economic growth in utilities and, and uh, automotive and electronics and healthcare. <laughs> I get it. I get it. 
big business, tech giants, geeks like me, we care, right? We're in it. We're thrilled by this. This is the next big thing. But why should you care? Well, we all want to live better lives. And the, the technologies that are inherent in the Internet of Things, like the ability to sense, communicate, acquire data, and so on, will help us build processes and systems that will deliver better health care through remote diagnostics and monitoring, and, and, and bring us safer environments with, like, early warning systems for tsunami or, or earthquake. And, and Tex already has a proven track record of providing new levels of comfort for us and certainly convenience in automating everyday tasks. But wisdom? What's that about? So let's reference the knowledge pyramid. We all know that wisdom comes from sensing the world around us and collecting all that raw data and seeing how it comes together with patterns and trends, and that turns into knowledge. And of course, what we derive from knowledge is wisdom. So yes, I believe that the Internet of Things well, is the perfect thing to collect a lot of this data, turn it into wisdom, and move the human race forward. Here's an example of knowledge to da or data to knowledge. Google flu. Have you heard of this? This is cool. So what, you know, what Google has done is they started tracking the location and frequency of search terms related to the flu. Flu symptoms, flu uh, diseases, flu treatments. And what they found is that there was a pattern that existed between these search terms and, and where flu activity was regionally. So they built this website, and it's used by hospital personnel, urgent care centers, and medical professionals of all kinds to understand what's occurring. Because we all know that the early detection of a disease can reduce the effect on a lot of us. So it's, it's certainly a, another case where the Internet of Things can be the way to aggregate this data and help us all. OK, so the Internet of Things, kind of big. A lot of people are interested in it. Looks like there might be some real, real world use cases, maybe even some great potential. But are there challenges? Are there pitfalls? Are there blind spots we don't even see yet? The answer is yes to all three. First, it's human nature to resist change, or as depicted in this slide, who moved my cheese syndrome. We've seen it time and again over the course of history. You've got uh, electricity and automobiles and airplane travel and the telephone, and oh, it took years from the point of invention to the point of widespread adoption. But it's all part of our normal lives today. So I, I posit that one of the challenges of the Internet of Things is to overcome this notion or belief that, you know what, everything's just fine the way it is. Maybe so. But then there's another component, a technical side to this, and it's that the Internet of Things is way too complex. I'd love to say that I'm a user of the Internet of Things, but in reality, I'm an integrator. It took me countless hours to put all that stuff together. <laughs> Most people are not going to do that. In fact, it was in 1991 that uh, Mark Weiser write, wrote an article for the Scientific American that said, the most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves in the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it. I 100% agree. Tech is its most useful when it disappears. Then no conversation about the Internet of Things is complete without discussing security and privacy. Privacy is paramount. Hey, I don't mind if my, my thermostat knows if I'm in the home or not, but it better not share that data with anybody else. And, and data in the aggregate, like we saw with the Google flu example, that's probably OK, as long as no personally identifiable information is shared as well. So security is also very, very important. In other words, I think a lot of us in here, and certainly I, am very comfortable with doing banking online, because I know that my banks have implemented security policies and technologies that ensure that I have a very secure connection with them. Can you say the same about my armband? Or my garage door opener? Mm, I don't know, maybe not yet. It's something I think we all need to work on. But what if, what if there was some application, some, some significant boost to our quality of life? Would that be enough to prompt us to move ahead with the Internet of Things? Let's go back to my morning. And there I am again, lying blissfully asleep. Or so it seems. 
Turns out, the sensors in my armband sense something's very wrong. My heart rate is going up, my breathing has is, is become erratic, and instead of this time gently waking me, it vibrates aggressively to get my attention, and as I, I roll over, I, I'm grabbing my chest, and I'm, I'm like, what's going on? So I reach over to my phone, and I pull it up, and sure enough, there's a message. It says, uh, I, I'm having high blood pressure, and my breathing is erratic, and, and, and it suggests that I take uh, two aspirin right away. And then, and then goes on to say, it says, uh, all of my vital signs have been recorded and electronically transmitted to my medical provider. So back at the back at the hospital, the doctor's already evaluating my data, and in his professional opinion, I need to get in the hospital right away. So he electronically dispatches EMT directly to my home, including pertinent data about my current medical situation so they know how to take care of me. And I even get a notice or a message from the EMT that they're about to arrive. I'm whisked into the hospital, and I'm put under care and observation. The good news is, later that morning, the doctor comes and says, you're going to be fine. You were suffering a heart attack, and we avoided any major damage because you got the treatment you needed in just the nick of time. So now, is the Internet of Things worth it? Maybe. All because things can talk to other things, or what we call the Internet of Things. Thank you.